Hi everyone, welcome to this panel session. Um, just get our slides back. Um, I want to thank you for all attending. Uh, there's been some great um, panels that I've already seen and been part of, and I've seen a lot of conversation uh, on social media about all the panels that unfortunately I wasn't able to attend. I want to welcome you to this panel session, Harbour Cities, Media in Urban and Regional Histories panel. Um, we have a lineup of a few great speakers here. Uh, we have Hans Ulrich Wagner, uh, Virginia Ma Maidstone, Justine Lloyd, and Chris Muller. I want to welcome them. Um, this session will go for about 40 minutes and we'll have questions at the end. There is a Q&A uh, tab down the bottom. So by all means, um, rather than waiting till the end, put your questions in there and we'll go through them at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for chairing this session and thank you for the kind introduction. To all of you, a warm welcome to this panel on Harbor Cities. A welcome to our one hour tour during which we explore the relationship of media and urban and regional histories. Before we start, please let me give you some brief information about the background of this panel proposal. My colleagues, Justine, Virginia, Chris and I, we are all members of a network entitled Transnational Media Histories. This cooperative project involves the Center for Media History at Macquarie University, the Center for Information and Communication Studies at Fudan University in Shanghai, and the Research Center Media History at Universität Hamburg. Founded in 2015, this network has been linked to work on what we call entangled media histories, which means we draw upon and contribute to concept as histoire croisée or connected history, or what is also called Verflechtungsgeschichte. Concepts we try to bring in to the field of media and communication studies. By doing so, our trilateral network has extended the research on media history beyond national boundaries and has enabled transnational research from a globally entangled perspective. It's not surprising that harbor cities are at the center of our collaborative work. Not only because Sydney, Shanghai and Hamburg are well-known and major maritime transport hubs, but also because the emerging field of harbor cities or port cities leads us to core questions of the construction of space, of communicative construction of images and imaginations of identities and communities. Taking them as case studies, we can explore the role of media for space construction, and we can focus on all the mediated ways of permanent practices. Harbor cities are perfect for understanding that space is something that can no longer be considered a homogeneous unit, something that is far from being a container as leading space theorists say. Harbor cities are nodal points for multi-layer approaches, for locality, for translocality and multi-locality. And they are area, areas of transitions that go beyond the region and the nation. So in our presentations, we will talk about various layers of spaces, about the local, the regional, the national, and the transnational layers. Layers that always play together when we talk about the construction of spaces. In late 2019, just before the pandemia crisis, we decided at a Shanghai meeting to work on a series of articles, smaller pieces, case studies that built a series for an online blog. 
My colleague Justine and I, we have been editing several contributions to this uh, series. You can find a first bunch of these studies on the website of the scientific journal Space and Culture. Our explorations today are referring to this ongoing research and our presentations want to give you more insight into this work. With this very brief introduction, I hand over to my colleague, Virginia Madsen. She is a senior lecturer and the convener of radio discipline of media at Macquarie University. And please, Virginia, give some more details about the conceptual framework we have been discussing and working on so far. Okay, thanks very much, Hans Ulrich. Um, I, before I go on, I do want to um, also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all gathered and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And I would like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today, as we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I also pay for my colleagues, pay respect to the Gadigal, Darug and Bidjigal peoples uh, and where I'm speaking from, the Dark and Junk people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hans Ulrich, um, for introducing our uh, joint project, which is still in progress. And um, we hope to have, uh, as, we, as Hans Ulrich has said, um, more articles to be published soon. And there will be other products of this uh, research, wonderful research collaboration that's been developing over a number of years now. I want to also talk now um, briefly about the Harbour City as being dimensional in many other ways for us. It is a place marked by and characterised by histories of arrivals and departures and mixing between worlds. The local topography in the colonial and post-colonial context allows for and has enabled this place of transit and exchange, offering like all ports, we would hope, safe haven for our transports and for people of all kinds who come to our harbours. And also at least the possibility for all this dynamic flow and movement, arrivals, departures, zones of interpenetration, encounters with home and the other, a sounding harbour channeling our reception and transmissions. Um, we also recognise that this cargo associated with our port cities is always multiple in nature. The harbour may be more open or closed, enabling a calling between, upon the in-between to invoke Paul Carter, who has written a lot about spatial history here in Australia. This is by definition then a space more open perhaps to movements of people, cultures and ideas, as well as material goods. Importantly, these harbours are products of time as well as space. They form in historical contexts, build for themselves infrastructures, which are also channels of communication and sites for creation, although that side of them may not always be visible. It may be audible, in fact. We may feel it in other ways, in our democracies, uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Hopefully our research reaches out from the objects or documents we are discovering and, and for example, examining uh, currently and writing around to encompass the multiple reverberations that context always carries. As this context changes too, we may find traces of past messages and forms which still can reverberate if we situate them so they might be heard again or in replay, these can make new connections. Um, let's not forget harbours are also products of forces which, can, which are concerned with the control of passage and sometimes even its censure. But they frequently open to the more chaotic and to that unruly imagination carried in new ideas and in the mix between outsider and insider, old and new. Our harbour cities are hubs for media in this sense. And in large hubs such as Sydney, Shanghai and Hamburg, they have become potential sites for media leadership. Sydney and Hamburg, for example, acted as centres or headquarters for fledglings, fledgling public service broadcasting media organisations 
in the period after post-World War II. We might identify and then chart this evolution from two very different regions in the media traditions we find in each and in the particular formations of media that have developed over time, these having consonant and also interlocutory traditions. The transport harbour frame here creates other ways of thinking about media traditions, which connect local to national, regional to national, regional to international, citizen to nation, and to an idea of the global and global citizen. Harbour media hubs or port cities like ours reveal an engagement with the city as a cosmos or cosmopolis and the cosmopolitan impulse, impulse if we look historically at the development, for example, of public service broadcasting in Hamburg and Sydney. They bring the world and ideas generated through their cosmopolitan mixing connecting individuals and local ways of seeing, hearing and experiencing with larger global currents. Harbour media cities can operate for us then on a metaphorical level. They are mediums for all the communicating angels and messengers who travel between states, cities, zones, regions, culture to culture, person to person, bringing with them not only news from the larger world, but registering and translating other ruminations from multiple locals, taking these voices to places defined as a beyond. This passage and transport is always challenging, but also potentially invigorating for these kinds of cities. So how does this space or frame, the harbour, relate then to our media traditions and the media histories we write? And the sites for immediate encounter that we may excavate anew here? and in the midst of both these material and immaterial exchanges. Why might we talk about media traditions and the forms coming from them in the context of these harbours, or as being formed somehow in the embrace and release of the harbour, and which continue to frame the cities which have been built up around them? Two cities represented here, and I'm giving an example, Hamburg from the global north, we might call it, and Sydney in the global south, connect in ways we cannot always see easily or clearly in terms of media. These city port media cities act as the frames, for example, for an analysis of an earlier period of public service broadcasting, which I will shed light on later. Hopefully these objects or fragments of a larger outpouring and which come together as small pieces of what has evolved as a larger idea of public service broadcasting can offer us a useful metaphor to engage with an entangled and transnational media history, as Hans Ulrich has just described, and also investigate the invisible and audible spaces of our cities. This kind of replay of found broadcasting objects, for example, may connect our two ports and the havens we can discover within these for public media institutions as we find them in formation. I think that's probably enough for now um, as, as an introduction to the broad field and to give you one example um, of these interconnections, but also to extend the idea of the harbour, the port and the media city as one that has invisible parameters and soundings uh, and is, a, is in both a container of real ideas and goods, but it is also a metaphor. Um, thank you, Virginia, and thanks also for your acknowledgement of country. Um, I'd just like to also acknowledge that we are meeting in the O'Regan room, and just to mention um, that Tom O'Regan had always been a big influence on my uh, thinking about media and space and also um, a very good colleague and friend of the Centre for Media History at Macquarie University. And I definitely remember a very influential uh, masterclass that I was part of where Tom talked about commercial media and uh, regions and cities. And I know that Tom uh, really wanted us to think about that relationship between media and space and place. Um, so it's very fitting and thank you to the conference organisers for um, putting our panel on in this room. So, um, Hans Ulrich and I will now have a bit of a discussion about our um, papers, or well, 
our short pieces really for the blog. And we wanted it to be very much in conversation because really this project has developed in conversation. Um, it started very much in person with some visits between Hamburg, um, Sydney, and also Shanghai, which was part of the original transnational network. Um, we want to sort of continue that conversation now and, um, and also in the question and answer. So we'd love it um, if you can pick up on any points you'd like to explore in the uh, question and answer later on, that would be great. Um, so we just wanted to start off with sort of how we thought of this conceptual framework, uh, which Hans Ulrich and Virginia have in, introduced, um, thinking about uh, cities as these places of flows and the ways that these media objects might move through them. To really pin that down, we, we started thinking about um, city, harbour cities and as media cities and thinking about uh, the communication and transportation network. So very kind of Raymond Williams idea, I guess, of communications and transportation is intimately linked um, and the, the way that cities are the places for that to happen, enabling that to happen. Um, so I guess in terms of thinking about uh, the conceptual framework and how we've applied it, um, is that Hans Ulrich and I could start off having a bit of a chat about that. The way I thought of it very much was um, what we talk about in our introduction to the, the blog series, which you can go away and have a look at in a little bit more depth. But um, we thought about it very much much in terms of uh, trying to use objects, media objects, so texts, as um, sort of detectors of the habitus of a particular place and time. So the way that we thought about um, the objects that we chose is that they show us sort of shifts, historical shifts. And some of the, um, we had a lot of debate as well about the time period that we were going to allow this, <laughs> this experiment to take place within in terms of media historical you know, um, trajectory. Um, and we had a lot of discussion about that, but it did tend to be um, from the 1920s till um, the, the Second World War. Um, we have a few that are a bit later than that, but originally when we were in Shanghai, that was the discussion that we had. And uh, what we could really see through that framework was that there were some really important shifts. So um, both Hans Ulrich and I, I think, have got interested in outside broadcasting um, and the sounds of the city coming into the studio and then going into the sort of um, broadcast network because of that uh, relationship. Um, but these sort of mediations of place that these objects tell us about, and that's very much how we've applied both of that. But um, is that kind of where you are thinking, you're nodding, I can see Hans Ulrich, so did you want to add anything there? Yes, I completely agree with the, what you said, and this was uh, somehow our idea that we discussed how to explore these things, and we, we came up with an idea that is based on a very simple idea, uh, we call, or people call these uh, this idea, based on key documents. We, we talk about key documents of transnational media history, histories, and we take what you said, media objects, media texts. We, we simply take one object, one media text, one what we consider to be a key document. That means that inherent in this document there is a story somehow hidden. You have to close read this text in order to find out what kind of spatial story, spatial stories, this document tells us. And so our very practical approach is to take one document or maybe two documents, but single documents and explore the story in this, the spatial story in this document. This is based on models, uh, maybe known all over the world. For example, in Germany, we have the key documents of German uh, Jewish history. This is something I like very much. It's an online uh, platform. And so I'm somehow inspired by this idea by the colleagues here in Hamburg, but it's also inspired by a book, maybe you know, The History of the Worlds in 100 Objects. It's by Neil McGregor, 
from the British Museum it was a BBC broadcast series and also a book. It, of course, we do not want to tell uh, uh, the story of the history of the world, but we want to tell stories of transnational media histories, stories of harbor cities, and to explore these, yeah, these multi-layer aspects uh, I mentioned, and what Virginia told us, these uh, areas of transition and, and so on. And so this practical idea to deal with single documents seems somehow, somehow interesting, and the first bunch is already online. Um, yeah, so we thought um, also we would talk about the sort of, I guess it's the methodology as well as the theoretical um, approach that we had at the same time because they're kind of interconnected. Um, so something that early on I came across when I was sort of starting to read around the topic of the Harbour City and media cities was um, doing an experiment. I actually do this with my students where I give them something to read and then we go off walking around the city. And this is um, obviously pre-COVID times. We would walk around uh, the harbour. We would go down to um, Miller's Point, which is part of the old harbour city in Sydney, which has obviously got a strong working class history, uh, had been a public housing, place of public housing, and um, has recently sort of been through a huge gentrification and the public housing has been moved away. And now Barangaroo is the sort of center of the global city in Sydney, right on the harbor, right on where the docks were and had been a place, very highly contested place. So I was looking for things to get my students to read before we walked around there to sort of get them a bit attuned to the city and, and sort of what they could observe. Um, and we did, you know, do some talks to people and so on. But one of the texts I came across that I really liked was a book um, called Seeing the Better City by Charles Wolfe. And in that, he had used this idea from um, the Australian novelist Gail Bell, um, who had been talking about, and I think we even have a slide on that. Um, sorry, Gail Jones on Five Bells, um, the novel, and um, had been had been talking talking about this idea that we have an idea of history as a, as a sort of form, form of progress, something that's rolling out and that we can sort of see, you know, on history's page, those kind of metaphors, of the, the, the story of Australia being rolled out, you know, in expansionist kind of territorial senses, um, a very sort of common metaphor. And I think Lisa Waller was talking a bit about that um, kind of idea of Australian rural life as sort of a progressive sense. Um, but I was interested in something he said using this idea from Gail Jones about the vertical history, sort of the more interiorized, the sort of perhaps the history that we might get into if we were able to go into people's media histories, you know, be able to understand their search history or what they've been listening to, the sort of more subjective um, history, which is not so visible in um, a lot of historical narratives and particularly I think in media history we struggled a bit with that how to sort of get at what the user what the audience is is feeling and thinking at the same time as understanding the sort of technological development kind of going along at the same time so I see the the horizontal history as this sort of history of progress and this vertical plunging down when you start to dig dig at the layers of a place you get to these sort of deeper connections that the place might have. And obviously, um, you know, Sydney Harbour is also a very um, strong settler colonial space. It has a lot to do with um, shipping and transport um, and uh, arrival, the arrival of narrative of settler um, settlement of Australia. And it obviously has a much longer indigenous history. And so all of these things come together at that place. Um, in this idea, I found it very useful then to think um, a little bit sort of backwards in terms of the, um, the history. Um, so starting with something and then looking at uh, other events that had happened previously rather than thinking forward. So thinking a bit backwards in the historical narrative and to get at some of those sort of um, deeper layers of historical narratives and media layers that were on in a particular place. So that's, I guess, where um, yeah, where I started to dig around the topic and look at the um, look at the place and the media and the, the transportation networks and the communication networks are all here in this um, particular site. So um, I know that um, 
Hans Ulrich has some really interesting examples that he could perhaps point to about Hamburg in this lens, yeah. using this lens. So one, one perfect example for how we tell these stories is uh, the Hamburg Harbor concept. This is a program that was initiated. Maybe we can have this slide. Yes, this exactly. This is um, a program uh, launched in 29 and it's still existing up to now. And this is the, the promotion of the Hamburg Harbor the broadcasting station promotes the harbor, the, the industry, the economic aspects, uh, and also, of course, the entertainment area. This is a district uh, performed, and the image of this district is performed in films, in videos, in songs, in, uh, of course, uh, posters, uh, and so on, and here on air. And this is very characteristic of Hamburg. They, took up all these images, these stereotypes, and reproduce these stereotypes. So what is interesting, it is somehow linked to what Justin just said, is that we have these particular stories, the one media text, the one broadcast, for example, but inherent in this particular document is something that is stable. The, the, the corpus of images imaginaire, uh, for example, and this is now a, a re-actualization of what is already known. And so this process of ongoing creating space, space ideas, spatial aspects, that is what I'm especially very interested in. And this somehow makes media history so interesting that we deal with this permanent, this ongoing process. Of course, dealing with exactly one text here at this moment. You see this famous uh, um, man, the moderator to the right, and uh, yeah, and uh, he is somehow known as the voice of Hamburg, the voice of Hamburg Harbor. And this um, program offer is a mix of music, of word, of interview, of reportage. We already mentioned this um, broadcasting uh, idea that came up in the 20s and 30s that we can have this out, uh, this broadcasting from somewhere in the space. And this was an, an event that they can broadcast from the board uh, of a ship from the harbor district and people listen to this early Sunday morning show uh, in the on the program. This is a piece that will be written later on. This is not already online. <laughs> That's um, coming up in the blog is the two. And, and you have had some issues with the copyright, I know. Of yes, the, of unfortunately, the German copyrights uh, regulation is very, very strict. So I even can't uh, offer the 29 record. Uh, it's not possible. Um, so in my case, I also interested in, oh, did you want to say anything else about that, Mitch? Um, no. Um, in my case, I uh, will just briefly go over the um, object that I chose. I, I snuck in, I did choose two objects because I thought they were related. Um, so one was I was finding these amazing images of harbour cruises that um, commercial radio stations were sponsoring in the 1930s. So um, after the Sydney Harbour Bridge was built, and that is a topic of another um, essay I should mention by um, Bridget Griffin Foley. So um, there's also an essay about the opening of the bridge and the broadcasting of the bridge. But after the bridge was built, um, there wasn't so much a need for harp for ferry to really be a transportation uh, means to cross the harbour, it became uh, more of a sort of tourism and a, an outing type of a sort of um, pleasure type activity and really got linked to these radio stations. So there's, um, there, uh, 2DW 2 had this kind of um, performance on, on board the harbour cruise, so on board the ferry cuttable. In 1937, so this is really at the height of the depression, 
and um, these little gnomes popped up. So these amazing archive of Sam Hood's photos. If anybody doesn't know about it, go and have a look at Sam Hood collection in the State Library of New South Wales. It's a wonderful collection of um, these glass plate images. So really rich uh, details that you find in there. So um, I found that there was these gnomes who were part of a radio broadcast and the audience got to hear them, um, hear the performers on the cruise and got to uh, go along and watch the, um, the performance live on the cruise and bought a ticket. It was a fundraising for a children's charity and uh, was very much sort of image in a really interesting way. So here are the gnomes uh, are much present in a lot of the photos. And uh, I went back through Trove and found the, um, the Wireless Weekly article, which was linked to this performance. So if we keep going, Kate, you'll get to that one in a couple. Yeah, there's the next one. So yeah, there's this sort of TUW children's um, hour and there was this outside broadcast linked to that. Then I started being getting quite interested in when was the first broadcast, outside broadcast involving Sydney Harbour. And this is this incredible story of, um, it was actually sponsored by the Public Works Department who were digging under the harbour. And um, so I chose this object to this for this second piece of writing, um, this expedition with um, radio broadcasting live with cables to the transmitter um, in Middle Harbour and Clontarf. So these, these uh, layers of kind of outside broadcasting and fascination with being outside in uh, the harbour space as sort of a network back to the home. Um, so I won't go much more into that because I know we're going to go over time otherwise. And um, this is uh, just some more pictures from this um, public works expedition, which was very, it was actually very hard to find out what they were actually doing in a lot of the um, discussions. It was a little bit more focused on what would the, what would the underwater scene sound like. They didn't actually talk about the sponsorship very much. So the public works department probably didn't get all the the bang for their buck that they had in sponsoring this broadcast. It was very fascinating to um, the media at the time. So future perspectives, what's next? Yeah, um, I want to briefly uh, mention that we have plans for the future and what we are talking about can be in the future and what we call um, an online environment, for example. So that means that we want to create a platform on which this, these documents will be available online. And uh, we invite people, or with this platform, we want to invite people to take these documents, the somehow essays, these, uh, these explanations to the documents, in order to explore their harbor cities, their space construction, the spatial aspects of, for example, uh, their towns and uh, cities. And that means that we give these documents in English or a translation into English and to uh, offer yeah, the way of exploring things, for example, in the Mediterranean area or the Baltic Sea region or wherever. And so to bring together this knowledge by us and the knowledge by them in order to create this online environment. This is, these are our plans for the future. And so we gave you an, a brief idea what this might be uh, in the future. I think we should hand over to Virginia and Chris because running out of time. Yes, indeed. All right then, uh, if it'd be possible to share my screen, um, I can put up the objects uh, that I'm dealing with here. Okay. Um, before I tell you what they are, um, I was really fascinated to see those diver images, Justine, um, uh, for, from early radio, because that is a motif that comes up again and again of, um, of live uh, broadcasts and going to places. And in those early periods of time, of course, you had to be hooked up and you had leads and everything. It was not possible to have wireless free um, connections. And of course, none of it uh, at that period would have been recorded. Um, 
It also alerts me to uh, something I found out many, many years ago when I first started becoming interested in radio and the history of radio. Um, and one of the things I found out about in Sydney in, and in terms of Sydney Harbour was that many of the radio programs that were made and recorded, and there were many, many, many programs that were recorded onto discs, um, much later, after the end of what we would have then called some years ago the golden age of radio, many years after that, um, radio stations started offloading all of these discs, and they were called transcription discs or um, just big recording discs of, uh, uh, on different surfaces, and they were uh, dumped into Sydney Harbour. And so at the bottom of that harbour now, if we were to dive down, uh, it might be possible to find, uh, as part of the infrastructure of, of the harbour, um, some of these transcription discs of radio programmes that have been long lost. I think this inspired me um, to, uh, to try and interact uh, with the radio as a listening, uh, uh, audible object. Um, I worked in radio as a presenter and producer at the ABC and before that community radio. Um, and this inspired me at first within the ABC to explore the archives that they did have of their earlier work. And it is very surprising to find out that so little exists before, let's say, the 50s. Um, thousands upon thousands of hours of radio, what I would call dr dramas, radio plays, um, documentaries and features, thousands and thousands of hours uh, had disappeared uh, because these were not kept. And even in the tape era, tapes were um, recorded over. So often programs would go missing. This apparently happened also, but to a lesser extent at BBC and probably at uh, in Hamburg at the public broadcasting station there. So I've chosen for my um, uh, objects, because that's what I'm gonna get to right now. I gave you a little bit of a sense that I was interested in the, in the idea that public service broadcasting um, creates a kind of haven for a certain sort of media creativity and media production that is not so easily possible uh, in other forms, for example, in commercial uh, radio uh, and commercial media. Certain kinds of journalistic, documentary, uh, arts and creative programming uh, could only develop or was only really developed uh, at the public service broadcaster. I'm not saying that there weren't drama and features and other things there at, in the early period, but certainly not so many, and they were not developed in the same way. Um, the, the pieces I've chosen, I mean, let's just hear a little bit of them. Um, if I can just see this. Um, there's two as well, just like Justine has got two. <laughs> um, I've picked them because they speak to one another. They do what I was trying to say at the beginning when we think about the harbours and the way the harbours look out at other harbours and the places of transmission, of arrivals and departures, of all sorts of things. So I, I wanted to look at two harbours that actually have commonalities, um, that have uh, a discussion that we don't know about, or, or it's very rarely um, mentioned. Uh, and it's important to the history of public service broadcasting, I think. So just a brief moment of this one. All that's left of a dead cocky. All that's left of a lost past. Egypt, Greece. And the voices fade back into the motor's roar, and the plane swings in over the last great panorama. Down there, a pattern of light and shade and green pasture and dun desert. Down there is the land which knew those voices, out of whose empty vastness here and there over a continent, out of whose empty silence the voices came. Yes, down there is Australia. Not very old as we know it but older in rock and reef than anywhere else on earth. What does it mean to us? What does it hold for us and the others that makes that vastness ours? What does it owe to us? What has it given to me and those whose voices float in the empty silence? No. 
say rather, what do we mean to the left? What will we make of it? What can we build there in the desert, here on the fertile coast, by which Australia shall remember us and we ourselves be remembered forever? Probably enough to hear of um, a 40 something minute program. Uh, one of the first uh, radio features that was made about Australia, uh, produced in Sydney, um, but by a BBC producer who was head and deputy head of what was then called the BBC Features Department. Um, this same department was influential somewhere else. So let me just take us to there. And that's from the program. That's a broad, that is a, a advert that you can see there from the Radio Times in the UK uh, at its 1949 broadcast, but it was made in 1948. And uh, it featured the rising star Peter Finch and the also rising star composer John Antill and his music specially composed uh, for that program. The other program um, is a discovery and uh, also part of the interaction I've had with Hamburg University and um, thanks so much to Hans Ulrich there. Um, it's a program called the 29th of January. And it was originally broadcast um, at the Hamburg station that had been set up uh, with Hamburg people, but by the BBC in the immediate post-war period. Um, and this station was modelled on BBC lines um, in, in terms of their cultural programs. Um, that they, they had input from BBC features and drama producers um, to start making a new kind of program and a program that might speak to the whole of the country, even though this was being broadcast and coming out of Hamburg. And the program is interesting because um, it came out of the producer and writer um, putting out a call, and radio could do this, for people to write in and to tell them what it was like on one frozen night, uh, a polar winter, they called it, um, in Germany, all across Germany. So it was to collect all of these voices, but through text, and then return them to, the, to a nation that was in ruins, uh, but in, some, in a way to return them to that nation in the form of a creative feature, as it was called. Let's just hear a little bit from this work. Sorry, I'm having a problem here. Hope this is the right bit. Beim letzten Ton des Zeitzeichens war es 24 Uhr. So that is the German version and very quickly. As produced by the BBC. It's all the way to that Australian program produced by a BBC producer. This was an adaptation of the work by Ernest Schnabel. This program does not set out to be anything more than a piece of journalism. It consists of facts. It is the total of what 35,000 Germans reported on the 29th of January 1947. What a dozen magistrates dealt with, what a weather station and an observatory noticed in the sky, and what two reporters noticed on a stroll through a German town. Okay, so we can't hear any more, but there's just so much in these two programs for me as someone who is investigating the history of documentary and the documentary imagination in radio, but also the development of a cultural form of radio broadcasting through the ABC in the haven of, of Sydney, but also other capitals, of course, in Sydney. Um, and it reveals how the region uh, and the local can speak to the nation, but also be informed by bigger and larger currents that are flowing through north and south uh, and, and around the world in this immediate post-war era, which was a, for a, a brief period of years, a moment for renewal and the new in broadcasting. And, and as this, if, you, if you can imagine it, as the harbour of Hamburg 
you know, largely destroyed is being rebuilt. So is the public broadcaster in Hamburg, which becomes the largest public broadcaster in Germany. And in Australia, there's a new interest in talking about ourselves. Who are we? Uh, what have we done? Where are we going? This sort of thing, a reflection. And the feature is the form that allows that reflection to occur. So for me, the harbour is being sounded, those discs at the bottom of the sea, because some of them definitely are there. The ABC's version of this program, for example, must be at the bottom of the sea or erased, uh, because the only version is the British version from uh, provided for me by the British Library and the BBC. Um, those other works are lost, but the harbour and these harbours that interconnect are resounded through these works, as is the, the infrastructure, the formation, um, that has its headquarters in Sydney, um, the ABC and NDR, later, uh, so North Deutsche Rundfunk and North West Deutsche Rundfunk, that become a leading public broadcaster in Germany, in West Germany, as it was later at that time. So I better end there. I'll un unshare. What's the, one, one more thing that is really interesting is that Schnabel um, also spent much of his time uh, before the war on ships, in merchant ships, and then he was drafted into the war, so he was again on ships. And he spent a lot of time in the dark, I suppose, on ships' decks looking out to sea, at least he writes about this. And I think that that also informs his work, that it, it is a work that illuminates um, but allows us to look into the dark um, where we don't need to always see everything as a visual presence, but we can sound it, we can hear it. Okay, well, thanks, thanks everyone. And um, thanks to my wonderful colleagues on this project and for putting together this panel, I'll try to be expedient. Um, my cue really is the idea of traveling and, and connecting vast distances and the way media is used. So I'm a research media theory and especially the way technology, media technology creates emotion. So that infrastructural dimension. A lot of my work is translation-based, um, both in language and in time. So I translate a lot of old media theory, um, in particular, the, the book, The Obsolescence of Human Beings uh, by Günther Anders from 1950. And um, his work is very interesting. It's one of the earliest reflections on television that I know of, philosophical re uh, reflections. And he talks about the idea that broadcast media create phantoms, world phantoms that are not representations as such, but um, they allow us to be present to events that happen elsewhere. And we as listeners and viewers experience these events as events and not as representations thereof. This for him also means that the world bizarrely becomes a kind of a stereotype, a template, a matrix that becomes the kind of uh, the thing that enables these phantoms to be released into this into our world. So he develops a really spooky and very uncanny media theory from this that is really precedent and it's being discovered at the moment, uh, also in the English speaking world. It has quite a following internationally. And I guess this whole collaboration enabled me to see this, this media theory, which can be quite broad in a very new light. Um, and uh, they kind of helped me bridge a gap to lived experience. And that brings me to the Sydney Harbour Bridge and especially its iconic fireworks, um, which have provided a surprisingly rich framework to think through the process of phantomization and I guess, entanglement of kind, to use that word, that Anders' work is so concerned about. So before I arrived in Australia two and a half years ago, um, watching the fireworks in Sydney, uh, the Sydney fireworks alongside my family back home in landlocked Switzerland was a real feature of um, New Year's Eve. And I think it's probably my earliest experience of the glow. So news bulletin, news, Bulletins um, on New Year's Eve feature the Sydney fireworks at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So counting down to Swiss um, on New Year's Eve. And so it kind of impresses this distance uh, 
in time and space and, and the vastness of the globe. And that's kind of how these broadcasts are used in the Swiss media context. So on the left-hand side, you can see a still from, I think it's a 2010 um, news broadcast of the Swiss broadcaster. And on the right-hand side, you can see the way that um, Swiss New Year's Eve is covered. We have like a collection of churches from all around regional Switzerland that um, uh, in Switzerland, we celebrate New Year's Eve by ringing of church bells. And it's a very introspective kind of activity. It's not really a big party in quite the same way. And I think this is really encapsulated by the way that the harbor and the openness of the harbor be becomes kind of used to produce a certain version of Swiss identity. And the news broadcaster at the time is saying, Sydney is once again serving with the big spoon. So they're like kind of using the big ladle and this kind of ex expression of exuberance becomes consumed for a Swiss audience. And um, so this kind of strange process really helps me or help the way I see Anders's work. So just to give you a, a short impression of how he writes. If we go to the next slide, um, there's an extract from a, a passage that is called The World in the Living Room. It says, um, whoever wants to be in the picture about the world outside or the world needs to go home where events are already waiting to be ordered into view and shoot out like drinking water from the tap. How else in the midst of the chaos of reality outside would one possibly be able to pick up uh, pick out something real that is more than just of local significance. Because the outside world is concealed by the world outside, it only becomes visible to us as we step inside and the door shuts behind our back. So this quote really speaks to this process of phantomization that Anders talks about. Um, it's kind of talks to the synchronization of experience of the production of a kind of a global imaginary that um, erases all the local nuances that might have existed in a pre-media time. Um, now, in the Swiss coverage, um, however, Sydney is somehow selected precisely to create the local, right? Even though the local is here created as a myth and is used to instill a kind of notion of togetherness that is kind of bizarrely um, created by thousands of people sitting alone at home or in, in their families at home. Um, there's a, not a layer to the process that Anders is talking about here. And I wanna explore this very uh, briefly by taking another step back in time to one of Anders' much earlier essays from 1930. And if we go to the next slide, you can see um, the essay is called Haunting and Radio, which is about this spookiness and you can see a picture here of a German family in 1920 it is quite literally wired into the into the radio set they're all connected by wires and this was the technology there was no loudspeakers and then for a very brief window in 1930 the loudspeaker is introduced and in Berlin there's only one radio station so suddenly uh, the broadcast becomes audible as a as a kind of a experience of um, in in the city, and what he says is I think quite interesting. So he says, stepping out of the house, the music coming from the speaker still sounds in the ear. One is in the music. The music is nowhere. After ten steps, the same music plays from the neighbor's house. Now that the music is also here, it is both here and there. It is localized like two poles that have been rammed into the ground. But it's the same music. Here X is singing what he began to sing there. Walking on, X picks up the song in the third house, accompanied by X from the second, whilst the careful X of the first is softly chiming in. So it's really dramatizing this experience of walking through the city as walking through one single broadcast. And Anders is asking, what is so shocking here? What is so uncanny? For him, the shock was that something non-local, -lo uh, like that couldn't be located. The experience of being in music, of being in a song, 
suddenly becomes this spatial experience, becomes transposed onto a cityscape. And that this kind of internal space of experience is, um, is uh, converted into a, new, um, into a new format. But I think um, this release of phantoms as he sees it can help us um, think about the process of the Sydney fireworks as well. It's speaking to this kind of strange synchronization, this strange unification that is happening. And so in 2020, I witnessed the fireworks for the very first time. It was a terrible bushfire night, and there was much debate about whether these fireworks should happen at all. Um, so from where I live or from my local park, I can actually see the Harbour Bridge. So I thought, well, I will go out and, and watch. And I was the, you know, um, it was very smoky, very uncomfortable. Now in the park, there was only very few people, almost no Australians. And um, even though it's a really good space from which to see the fireworks and everyone in the park was uh, either a tourist or um, an expat. And like I did myself, everyone was videoing the firework and sending it back home, right? And looking back now, it really struck me that in a sense, um, this image of the family all wired together and the broadcast somehow being that connecting synchronization um, is exactly what I was kind of doing by sending the firework back home. I was reconnecting to the memory of watching the broadcast. Right? So um, in a sense, I guess the fact that the fireworks went ahead points out that it was, um, you know, how important it is as like Sydney's calling card to the world, that it's a feature in, in a global media scape that, that has to go ahead at all costs. But there's also this kind of, I guess, more intimate dimension in which these um, broadcasts can create local contexts, um, familiar contexts and ideas of nation that are uh, very um, uh, profound and, and complex. So in, in short, for me, the fireworks became the uh, perfect example of at once some sort of template for a broadcast, but also something that is happening, something that is more real or more pragmatically useful or influential as a broadcast than as a real world event. So, and in this sense, I thought the phantom connects to the harbor as a space. Um, it's kind of both here and not here. Uh, it's kind of located and non-locatable. It's a kind of a, a space of exchange and change that can't really be fixed. Um, so yeah, and uh, it inevitably invites and I guess, produces uh, articulations of identity, of regionality, of history, precisely by somehow questioning all those kind of registers by troubling all those boundaries. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop there, I'm conscious of the time. Um, so yeah, I hope that kind of made sense and connects back to the, to the opening of this panel and the questions raised. Thanks, Chris. Um, Thank you to all the panel members. Um, we have gone a little bit over time. The next sessions will start in 10 minutes, but if anyone does have any questions, there's been a couple um, in the chat, but they've been answered already. I already answered one question that was in the chat. So key documents is not the aspect of being important, but being, or telling a good story, there's just more the aspects we have in mind. Yeah, I think the, the question was also about how we chose which documents. So we, we were very um, anarchic. We just left it up to the author to choose that. There was no list of documents that we came up with as a group. Yeah. Um, we left there is no to, canon. <laughs> <laughs> we left it to people sort of choose something that spoke to obviously the research interests that they have and also um, what it was about the city media connection that they really wanted to illustrate, I suppose. Yep. But yeah, it, 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 even that getting to that point of just talking about which, how we would approach it and what the sort of format would be that that was a debate um, in itself. Yep. And thank you for the other comments. I do think that 
Susan's comment about sort of going from that hardwired listening space to then sort of more a, um, a, not a, a public listening but it, within a, organized, a small group listening um, and then now to individualize localized listening that's such an interesting trajectory that comes through in in Chris's paper um, and in those images that you've selected there Chris so mm -hmm. thanks for those comments thanks everyone um, so we're going to wrap it up there's about nine minutes until the next session so enough time to quickly um, end this session stretch grab a drink and we will see you this will be the last session uh, for the day um, so once you've finished in whichever session you choose, um, that will be the end and I will see you all again tomorrow. Thank you.